Hello! We have been waiting for the sequel to the one to the one and only Ivan and it finally came out cut just a couple days ago. I got it. It's called the one and only Bob. So all of my third graders this year read the one and only Ivan with me in library and we are now ready for the one and only Bob. So I hope all my third graders will get a chance to see this. Now anybody of course can listen. You'll be able to understand the story. It will just be um, a little clearer and more meaningful, certainly more meaningful, if you read the first one first, which is the one and only Ivan. And that is slated to come out as a Disney movie. This was supposed to be August. Hopefully it'll still be August. Um, so you definitely want to check that out. Um, it's going to be amazing. All right, so if you read uh, the one and only Ivan with me, you know the chapters are not numbered and they're very, very short, like that's a whole chapter. So I will just read each video for about 15 minutes um, and I'll number them like part one, part two, part three, so you can keep them in order, but the chapters are not numbered. All right, it starts with a cool little picture, a glossary here to tell us the meaning of Bob's poses. Let's see, it says, let's play, life's good, get lost, I'm scared, I'm cool, and I surrender. So when they show those pictures in the story, we'll stop and figure out what that means. So it's right away on the first page. We can see him in one of those positions. You can see the life's good, and there it is. So when the story starts, life's good. It's called Confession. Look, nobody's ever accused me of being a good dog. I bark at empty air. I eat cat litter. I roll in garbage to enhance my aroma. I harass innocent squirrels. I hog the couch. I lick myself in the presence of company. I'm no saint, okay? And wow, we're at it. I may or may not have eaten a pepperoni pizza with anchovies when nobody was looking. Also, I may or may not have eaten a coconut vanilla birthday cake when nobody was looking. Also, I may or may not have eaten a Thanksgiving turkey, except for the stuffing, way too much rosemary, when nobody was looking. Nobody looking. That seems to be the common thread. As they say on the crime shows, motive and opportunity. This one's called Robert. Name's Bob. I'm a mutt of uncertain heritage, definitely some chihuahua with a smudge of papillion on my father's side. You're probably thinking I'm some wimpy lap dog, the kind you see poking out of an old lady's purse like a hairy keychain, but size ain't everything. It's swagger, attitude, you gotta have the moves. Probably I should have been named Bruiser or Bam Bam or Bandit, but Bob's what I got and Bob will do just fine. Julia named me long time ago. She's my girl. She calls me Robert when I get on her nerves. Happens pretty often, to be honest. This is called Numero Uno. There's an old saying about us dogs. It goes like this. It's no coincidence that man's best friend can't talk. Let me tell you something. If we could talk to people, they'd get an earful. You ever hear anyone mention man, being's, man being dog's best friend? Nope. I didn't think so. Way I've always figured it, end of the day, you gotta be your own best friend. Look out for numero uno. Learned that the hard way. That's not to say I don't have a best pal. I do. Gorilla, name of Ivan. Big guy and I, I go, big guy and I go way, way back. Gorilla and dog. Yep, I know, you don't see that every day. Long story. I love that big old ape. Ditto our little elephant friend, Ruby. They're the best. And of course, if you haven't read the first book, The One and Only Ivan, that's the, the basis of that story is how the three of them become friends. Uh, it's an amazing story based on a true story. This one is called How We Met. So they're going to give us a little summary, like a recap of how they met. But really, the it's a wonderful story, so make sure you read the first one too. The first time I met Ivan, I was a homeless puppy, desperate, starving, all alone. It was the middle of the night, and I'd slipped into the mall where Ivan lived in a cage. I wondered a bit, grateful for the warmth, confused by the weird assortment of sleeping animals. Okay, hang on. Okay, sorry, those were my dogs. All right, we'll go back. I wandered a bit, grateful for the warmth, confused by the weird assortment of sleeping animals I found there, checking every trash can for anything edible. There was a small hole in a corner of Ivan's enclosure. He was fast asleep, cuddled up with a worn, stuffed animal that looked like a weary gorilla. He was snoring, and man, that guy snored like a pro. In his open palm was a chunk of banana, and I still get shivers when I think about this, but I ate it right out of his hand. Guy could have squeezed his fingers shut, and I would have popped like a puffy balloon, a puppy balloon, but he just kept on sleeping. And then, more shivers, I'm either a maniac or the bravest dog on the planet. 
probably a little bit of both, I hopped up onto that big round furry tummy of his. That's right, I climbed Mount Ivan. Crazy, I know. I have no idea what I was thinking. Maybe I was so exhausted I went a little bonkers. Maybe he just looked so warm and cozy that I figured it was worth taking a chance. I did my best. I did my bed boogie. Dogs don't feel right till we do a little quick dance before settling. <coughs> Excuse me. Once I had things just so, I lay down in a little puppy lump and rode the waves on that tummy like a puny boat on a great brown sea. When Ivan opened his eyes the next morning, he didn't seem surprised in the least to find a puppy snoozing on his belly. He refused to move until I woke up. I think he was glad I, I think he was as glad as I was to have found a new friend. And there's Ivan and in the one and only Ivan, we hear a lot of references to uh, Bob sleeping on Ivan's belly and Ivan never moved. He never wanted to disturb him when he was up there. This is called The Amazing History of Man's Best Friend. Before long, me and Ivan were best buddies. We're an unlikely pair, sure. Ivan's calm and serene, a philosopher, an artist. I wish I could be more like that. No one's ever accused me of being level-headed. Hot-headed, sure. And I can... And I can't talk pretty like Ivan can. I'm a street dog, after all, and proud of it. Still, we clicked in a way that I never had with humans. <coughs> Excuse me. Man's best friend? No way. Gorilla's best friend? You bet. Seems to me the first time I ever heard that phrase, man's best friend, was while I was watching TV with Ivan. Back in the day, Ivan had this little television, and we watched a lot of stuff together. Old movies, westerns, cartoons, you name it. Poor guy was stuck in a cage, didn't have a lot a lot else to do except throw me balls at gaping humans. And my third graders remember what the me balls are, right? Anyways, me and Ivan, big fans of the tube, cat food commercials, pro bowling, dancing with the stars, what's not to like? Once we watched this special on the Nature Channel, it was called The Amazing History of Man's Best Friend. Show was all about famous dogs. There were rescue dogs and therapy dogs and war dogs and fire dogs and movie dogs and this dogs and that dogs. Between you and me, most of them were just plain overachievers. Then they got to this dog named Hatch something or other. Hatchet Toe, maybe? Seems his owner died, for the record. I object to the word owner, but we'll set aside that for now. Hatch something or other sat around for over nine years in the same spot at the same train station, day after day, waiting for him to return. This is the narrator guy was thing is the narrator guy was blabbing on and on about this dog really over the top stuff how loyal how loving break out the kleenex blah 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 wham 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 man's best friend they made a statue of this dog i kid you not a statue of the dog who sat around nine years waiting for a dead guy and that's a true story it's really good it's a movie and a book oh here comes <laughs> Alright, she stopped again. So I do love the really short chapters in this book. I think it makes it go really quickly. And this one's called, in my opinion, that dog was a ninny, a numbskull, a nincompoop. I'm yours. Let me tell you about ma being man's best friend. Being man's best friend can mean a lot of things. Companionship, belly rubs, tennis balls, but it can also mean a dark, endless highway and an open truck window. And again, the third graders, if you remember, um, we learned how Bob became a stray. This was, uh, was a, a tough reality. It can mean the smell of the wet wind as hands grab the box you're, you're in with your brothers and sisters and you go sailing into the unkind night and still, still, crazy as it sounds, you're thinking, but I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. That was terrible how he started. This is called no one. That's what being man's best friend can get you. A black highway, an empty box, and no one in the world but you. So if you haven't read that first story yet, he's the only one in his litter to survive um, after being thrown from a truck. So then he wanders and ends up at the um, the weird roadside st sort of circus slash uh, truck stop where Ivan is. This is called Early Days. I don't remember much about my early puppy days. It was three years ago, but sometimes it feels like 300. Mostly I recall fighting with my sibs for the primo meal spot. Lots of squirming and squeaking. Everything soft and milk smelling and movable, like we were one great big complicated animal. I never met my dad and my mom didn't say much about him except that he was trouble. Mom had a beautiful fawn coat, chihuahua, some this, some that. Nice messy bloodline. Mutts rule. Mom crooned to us, told us stories, laid down the law. I wonder if she knew she didn't have much time to prepare us for the world. 
We were born in a dark place, probably under some porch stairs, I suspect, since I remember the sound of boots plodding up and down, the biting and ugly smell of human feet. They called my mom Rio, and they fed her most days, though sometimes she had to fend for herself. She never showed fear toward them, or respect. Indifference, I guess you'd say. Unless they tried to handle one of us, she growled then, hoping to make it clear that we were hers and hers alone. I myself got picked up a couple times. The hands reached in, grabbed. They were rough and smelled of strange scents, bitter and meaty. My mom's growl made me fearless, and I wriggled and yipped. The hands shoved me back to the warm place where I could sleep and drink and dream in safety. Still, I understood in my simple puppy way that dogs belonged to humans, and that was how it would always be. This is called Boss. My mom wasn't much for names. She'd had a lot of litters. I guess she'd run out of ideas. My brother first was Natch, the firstborn. Runt, my youngest bro, was the last. Dot had a little spot on her back, and Yip was always complaining. I was rowdy, goes without saying, and that left my oldest sister. We all called her Boss. Boss was small but mean, with a distinctive, sharp-sounding bark. She could outmaneuver any of us to the best spot for dining. I admired her grit, even if she did get on my nerves. When we got a bit older, less blind, more cocky, I fought her off occasionally, but mostly Boss won. She was fearless, that pup. This is called alone. The truck happened without warning one night. They threw us in a box, left my mom behind. I could still hear her frantic howls. I landed in a muddy ditch. It was a cloudy night, nearly freezing. Even the moon had abandoned me. And the smells, everything so wild and unknown. Animals with big jaws and bigger appetites. Birds that swooped in to kill. Death and life all mixed up together. I searched for my siblings until the truth became clear. I was utterly alone. Just a terrible, terrible beginning. This is called Cars. The next morning, I began my slow journey, moving through the tall, wet grass, my limbs stiff from the cold. Now and then, I'd drink from a mud puddle or gnaw on some grass. By evening, I was wobbly with hunger and thirst. I followed the highway. Every time a four-wheeled creature roared by, I froze in fear. And yet, and this is what slays me, I knew that cars meant humans, and humans meant the possibility of living just as much as they meant the possibility of dying. This is called the owl. Darkness had fallen when it came out of nowhere, the owl, a shadow in a shadow. They don't make a sound, you know, not a sound. It's quite impressive when you think about it. This is called luck. Just as her talons, those marvelous weapons, raked my fur, I caught my right front foot in a small hole and stumbled. If she'd gotten hold of my body, I wouldn't be here, but all she managed to do was grab my tail. Only time in my life I've regretted my handsome hind quarters. I was airborne, hanging upside down, dizzy and dazed, and just crazy enough to think, hey, I'm actually flying, for the terror hit full force. I caught a whiff of other animals below. Later I found out they were pocket gophers, but back then I just knew I was smelling something completely foreign. The owl must have decided the gophers would make a more satisfying meal. She let loose her grip, and I plummeted to the earth. More luck. Maybe it was my puppy fat, or my soft bones, or my incredibly good fortune, but I didn't die. Didn't even break anything. I'd flown twice in my short life and lived to tell the tale. This is called Will. I found a, ho a small hollow at the base of a fallen tree, poked my nose in and got a swat and a hiss from a grouchy raccoon. Kept going, waddling, whimpering, lights ahead, new strange smells. Kept going, kept going. It's amazing how much the sheer will not to die can keep you moving. This is called Exit 8. And again, you know Exit 8 if you read the first book. I finally came to a small road curving off the main highway. Exit 8 turned out to be a big billboard overhead had a picture of a terrifying animal on it. Of course, I didn't know what a billboard was, didn't know that the scary animal was a gorilla, let alone that he would become my dearest friend. But something told me to follow the off-ramp. And eventually, I ended up at the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan. I made it to the mall, slept in dirty hay by some garbage bins. The next night, I found that hole in Ivan's cage, stole his banana, slept on his belly. And the rest, as they say, is history. For two years, I lived at that seedy old place that was part mall, part circus, and all crummy. But that was nothing compared to Ivan. He spent 27 lousy years there. And our dear friend Stella, our old circus, an old circus elephant, was stuck there for most of her life, too. When Stella passed away, it nearly broke Ivan's heart. And I tried like crazy to go get him through those dark days. But what really saved him, I think, was Ruby, 
our baby elephant friend. Before Stella died, Ivan promised her he'd get Ruby out of that awful place, and to my amazement, he actually pulled it off. Ivan and Ruby and a bunch of our other pals ended up going to different places, zoos and sanctuaries that knew how to take care of them. They're with others of their own kind, and they're loved and well cared for. It's been over a year now since we all moved, and they seem so much happier. Me, I lucked out. My girl, Julia, whose dad had worked at the mall, decided her family needed a dog. Who was I to argue? Two square meals, my own bed, all the belly rubs I could beg for. What dog in his right mind would say no to that? The best part is we don't live far from Ivan and Ruby. I get to see them all the time. I'm glad they're nearby, and I'm thrilled they've settled in so well. Really, it's a solid solution, but it's not a perfect one. All right, I'm going to stop there, and then we'll start again with the second reading, which will start with the chapter called Tennis Ball.